I'm reading Swift Rivers by Cornelia Meigs. This is chapter four, chapter four B. Chapter four is titled Marching Waters. Chris looked back as they came through the mouth of the river and slid into the wide reach of the Mississippi. It was full daylight now. One of those clear summer mornings on which it seems that one can see for an infinite number of miles. It would be hot later. The sky was pale and the pale creamy clouds piled high and rolling were scarcely distinguishable against the faint blue. The boy could see afar up a great length of the course of the Goosewing River to where the green hills began to rise and to the faint distant looming of the higher range within whose folds lay his own valley. He had a strange sense of there being something very great and portentous in their slow progress out from the smaller river into the greater. And yet the raft was a mere dot in that wide landscape and he himself the tiniest of figures standing at the stern. The voyage of a raft has long monotonous stretches interspersed with moments of sharp danger. It is a frail craft at best laid flat upon the water undulating from end to end apparently with no more substance than a sheet of paper. It is usually 400 feet long more than the length of a modern city block and with the brails laid side by side, nearly half as wide. A furious wind can rock and toss the logs until occasionally they wash out of their floating framework and are scattered over the river. There are long chains of rapids where it has happened to more than one pilot, sliding downward with the angry water to run afoul of a sharp reef and rip his craft from end to end, sending the logs swirling over the face of the whole stream, perhaps never to be gathered again. Con O'Blenz, a genial cook, said to Stuart and Chris, It is a job to break your heart, trying to get a raft together once it's been broken up. Every man on the river wants to ship with a good pilot who won't get his crew into such a jam. They all try their best to get work under Pierre Dumanel, he added in a whisper, or with Joe Langford. Dumanel was not to take the logs all the way to St. Louis, it was revealed. Canny Shreve McLeod, making the most of his two good pilots, who would not meet, used Pierre for the most part on the upper reach of the voyage, and let Langford take over the task for the last half of the way. Joe Langford was ahead of them now, setting out from Prairie du Chien for the first run of the season. Later, he would take command after Dumanau had brought them below the great barrier, barrier of the first rapids. Not only did the valley of the great stream wind southward with never a straight mile anywhere, but also the current and the channel went back and forth between the banks with an infinity of twists and turns. This channel, every floating craft must this channel, every floating craft must follow, even though the shallow draft of a raft gave it a little more freedom than had the deeper keel boats. Each passage from shore to shore was called a crossing and only by knowing the crossings and all their shifts and changes could a man steer safely the craft under his charge. Lone Tree Crossing is the worst place on the river, Cono Blinds informed the two. Wherever you see a riverman talking, wherever you see rivermen talking together, you know they may be arguing whether the rapids at Rock Island or the rapids opposite the mouth of the Des Moines River are the worst but they'll all be agreeing that they don't dread rapids as they do the Lone Tree Bar. Pierre will carry us over the first rapids, but it's Langford who will be steering us when we come to Lone Tree Crossing. There's no pilot or crew breathes it easy until they're clear of it. Pierre Dumanal had taken Chris with him as oarsman one day when they went ashore on the raft boat, a shallow water cousin to the Atlantic Coast Dory. They landed at a handful of houses, which hopeful persons might have called a town, and where a little store contained frontier supplies laboriously freighted up the river. They bought food and quinine from a small whining man, perpetually complaining of the bad times. His wife was a comely woman with a tired, sensible face. She packed up the purchases which Pierre had made and, while doing so, held a whispered colloquy with her husband in a corner. The man, unwilling to do something which his wife was urging, presently raised his voice in alarmed re remonstrance. You'll get us in trouble, Deborah, if you go talking about things you've no business to. Deborah, however, driven evidently by conscience, was not to be silenced. Since her husband would not speak, she came forward to address Pierre Dumanal herself. There was a raft passed down last week, the first that came this season, starting from Prairie du Chin. 
Isn't that 100 miles below the goose wing? Her pilot was, was once a friend of, friend of yours, Pierre. It required a braver person than the little storekeeper to face the hard stare which Pierre Dumanel bent upon her. But with the persistence of a woman following her sense of right, Deborah went on determinedly. Joe Langford was sick, dreadfully sick, when they brought the raft inshore and asked if they could carry him up into our place to lie in a bed for a few days. I did what I could for him, but he was in one of those wasting fevers that just go through with their course and no one can stop them. He was out of his head, or they wouldn't have been able to get him to leave his raft. He lay here raving for three nights and he kept calling for you, Pierre, for you, all the time. He got a little better finally and there was no keeping him here once he could leave his bed. He looked to me like a man sick to death, but he would go on. I, I was certain you ought to know, Pierre Dumanau though I know you don't thank me for telling you. Dumanau's French politeness did not allow him to be rude to a lady, even though she was a backwoodsman's wife in, the, in a linsey woolsey dress and a denim apron. You have done what you thought you ought to, he said to her in a tone which held no hint of expression. But now that your duty is performed, we need say no more. Without a backward glance, he walked out of the store and made his way to the boat lying on the shore. He did not speak for some time, but finally, when they were halfway back to the raft, he made some observation to Chris in his ordinary voice, and from that time on, talked to him of water and currents, all the small matters of life on the river. Neither then nor later did he make reference to what the conscientious Deborah, the conscientious Deborah had said to him. Although Chris Dahlberg was technically the owner of a large portion of the logs which they were carrying southward with such care, not one of the crew treated him other than as a raft hand, a young and inexperienced one who had much to learn. The men were an odd assortment of husky fellows who seemed to have but one thing in common, a coarseness and hardness beyond anything which Chris had ever dreamed of. Their toiling, comfortless life appeared to have made of their, mind, made of their minds and hearts a barren waste. From their talk, it was to be gathered that their only thoughts were concerned with the end of the voyage and the joys of flinging their wages broadcast in a brief space of glorious freedom before they were penniless and must set to work again. They talked much, all of them, of the one or two stopping places which their course afforded. The two stretches of rapids could only be passed under proper conditions of weather and water. We always tie up for a bit when we go get to the Rock Island Rapids to wait for the winds to be right, Jacob Wolf told the two boys, and the Des Moines Rapids too, might hold us up for a while at Montrose. That's the time when a man can look forward to a little pleasure ashore. Chris wondered often whether Stuart Hale would endure for a long a state of things, which seemed exactly calculated to arouse his fretting impatience. Dumanau ruled with iron discipline. His orders were quick and must be instantly obeyed. The work was heavy. The food was coarse. There were days when the blaze of the sun above the reflected glare from the water made the heat almost unbearable. The crossed raft lines, which held the whole structure in its proper shape, were prone to stretch so that there was con constant labor at the winding, the heavy windlasses, to keep them taut. There was no real dullness, however, in a journey which was always on the point of a turning corner into a new scene of adventure amongst the islands and sandbars. And the evenings and the summer nights made up for anything which the day might bring. The sun would go down in crimson majesty behind the green bluffs. The cool dark would come with a soft breeze to creep over the water and fan hot burn faces. The canopy of stars would hang splendidly overhead with a rippling pattern of their brightness reflected in the water below. The voice of the river, never so audible by day, could be heard deep and commanding as the huge body of water carrying the tiny speck of the raft along with it went marching past the silent forest and never resting pilgrimage. Stuart and Chris, lying side by side with their faces to the sky, would talk in whispers, while their comrades sprawled in ungainly attitudes of slumber all about them. Pierre Dumanal seemed, indeed, to require only half the amount of slumber that another man would take. Chris always thought of him, afterward, afterward, as he used to see him on those soft June nights, standing erect in the stern with his eyes fixed far away, a magnificent bronze statue against the stars. As their journey progressed, some of the boats which they met would lie alongside for a little, 
to exchange talk and tobacco and to compare notes on the upper and lower portions of the channel. The boys began to hear more and more of that next hazard which they were to pass, the chain of rapids at the foot of which the big rock of which lay the big rock island. Pierre Dumanal asked anxiously of every man with whom he could get speech, what was the stage of the water on the rock island reefs? It was going down, each one told him. As the reports gave it as falling lower and lower, the pilot's face became increasingly troubled. The last man with whom they spoke, a trader paddling a canoe northward, gave the most discouraging report of all. This raft of yours makes four that started from places on the Mississippi south of the Goose Wing and gone down this season. Only one got over the rapids. The two that followed don't dare run farther and are tied up at the banks above the Rock Island. The men are all waiting, idle, for a rain to come. Chris had an opportunity to speak to him in an undertone just before he cast loose. Was one of those rafts that are waiting, was one Joe Langford's? The trader shot a cautious glance all about lest Pierre over here. All the river, it seemed, knew what it was to speak that name in Dumanel's presence. No, he replied for Chris alone. Joe's was the first raft and he went over. They say he was sick, but wouldn't give up for all his men could say to him. I met him just as he was swinging out on the rapids and I'm sure he got past them safe. He and Pierre are the only two who would have dared such a thing in this low water. It was the next day that the voyagers dropped round the final bend and came within sight of the rapids at last. At the foot of them, long and low, lay a great island with shores of white stone. The smoke of an Indian village went up from a green headland on the eastern shore. But on the west bank were white men's cabins and a lengthy building of logs set a hundred yards from the water's edge. Two rafts, both smaller than theirs, lay moored to the bank. As they came near, Chris could see breaks and riffles in the water, showing where the sharp reefs stretched below the surface. Some of the rocks lay bare and dry in the hot sun, their jagged outline giving hint of what dangers were hidden just beneath the water. It was not a stretch of tumbling foam and whirlpools as rapids are in a smaller stream. The Mississippi is too big for that. It was a faintly discernible slope, many miles long, broken and crisscrossed and interlaced with sinister dark streaks where a huge rushing current fell from pool to pool over sharp edged barriers of upturned rocks. The old Mississippi showing her teeth, commented Con O'Blins. There was running and shouting and a splash of the sweeps in the water for the raft was to come to land for the first time since they had set out. The men were wild to get ashore. All along the bank were loud calls of greeting from friends on other rafts whose crew were waiting in noisy idleness for the water to rise. Pierre Dumanal, however, kept all of his men busy, tightening up lines and warping the great craft into exactly the right mooring, so that it was evening before they were free. For once, they were unexcited by the announcement, grub pile, and could scarcely wait to bolt the supper which Khan set before them. The goal of their anticipation was the long building which bore the ominously hospitable sign, Mike Shannon's Place. Come in. Stuart and Chris were also looking forward to the opportunity of stretching their legs on dry land once more. There were a few last duties still to be performed, however, and these they stayed to finish while the rest of the crew went hurrying over the side and scrambling up the bank. But Con O'Blins, clearing up after the hasty supper, spoke to the boys in friendly warning. If I was you, I wouldn't go ashore tonight, he advised. A place like this, with a gang of idle rafting crews in it, makes about the toughest spot you could ever hope to find. There's many a one who wasn't on to the ways of things that's been found in the morning with a split head and his pockets empty. Not that they're really a bad lot, he made haste to explain, but it's just that they fall out with strangers when they're drinking and excited like. <laughs>